Thank you. Ah, who made it to my presentation the other day about smelly spreadsheets? I did. Cool. Well, it's going to surprise you because I'm actually going to advocate for a spreadsheet today. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the point of this presentation is to give you guys a framework to help solve your own crazy hard problems that you're going to come across in your daily work. And so by crazy hard problems, you know, in the domain of tech, software, and GIS, there are things with like lots of competing elements and a real lack of clarity of how you even start to make progress on this thing. One of the examples I'm going to kind of talk about today is this project. So Super Air, uh, they're an aerial top dressing company, so they spread fertilizer on farms, particularly farms where it's like, you know, they don't, or where they don't have the flat land and it's harder for um, them to do it through a truck or something like that. And the way that when a farmer would come to them and they would say, hey, how much is it going to cost to spread fertilizer on my farm? Uh, they were kind of doing that in the spreadsheet. <coughs> and <laughs> it was terrible. It kind of assumed the farm was a circle and the, basically the prices that they would estimate and what it would actually cost to spread were off by you know $10,000 a job. And they wanted a better way of being able to estimate that cost. And obviously we do uh, balances mapping support. so. They kind of got us involved uh, in that and see if we could do something smarter using maps. So this is the framework for solving crazy complex problems. The first thing is understanding the problem or trying to understand it. And the second part is breaking it into smaller parts, which help you understand the problem better and you can feed that back in. So now I'm just going to go through that in a bit more detail and explain it with some examples. So first part, understanding the actual problem. Honestly, this is the hardest bit, and often things that are complex, it's that complexity arises because you just don't understand the problem that well. There's no one-size-fits-all method for understanding. It really depends on the problem and the domain, and there'll be different techniques and knowledge that come into play um, for different domains. But it's really important. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how well you solve the wrong problem. So my tips for this is to really make sure you focus on the user, the people who are actually using this thing and getting value from it. So that's not, if you're a consultant like us, that's not the client, it's not the project manager, it's not your colleagues. Um, don't trust anyone's preconceptions, including your own. You possibly have thought up some ideas or a technology or something you can use, but don't. Just <laughs> let those wash away and avoid solutioneering. So when someone says, oh, you can do a drop down to, to ask that, or it's got to be elastic DB or something, doesn't matter. Put all that aside um, and try to really understand what the users want, because they don't want technology. Um, and a lot of this ends up actually being about uh, managing people and the client, um, and definitely not the end user. And everyone just has ideas that they try to throw into the ring, um, some shiny new tech they've heard. And a lot of people will come from that kind of solutioneering approach, which just isn't that helpful. At the end of the day, you won't know the answers. But it's OK. Don't panic. Nobody gets this reference anymore, do they? <laughs> I feel old. Cool. So break it into smaller parts. Um, you don't need to solve the whole problem all at once. Think about like how you solve a jigsaw. You start by finding all the edge pieces or picking all the pieces in one color. You're actually breaking the problem down into a single dimension that you can start to solve um, you know, at one at a time. And basically identify a thread that you can start to pick at. So my tips here, it's literally just find the next easiest thing. So identify that single dimension and avoid when lots of dimensions get mixed together. Um, so sometimes you're trying to learn, solve a problem, and but you're doing it in a new technology stack. Well, go off and play with the technology stack and then apply the problem to it or something like that. Um, focused prototypes, really helpful here. And those actually make kind of a testing and feedback loop. The things you learn from your prototypes, you can feedback. Uh, into your next iteration, and you can really write focused tests. But at the end of the day, it just comes down to that find a thread and start pulling. But you also need to be careful when to stop. I don't know, there's not 
also a hard and fast rule for this either, but essentially we, you've broken the problem down to smaller parts. Hopefully they have smaller scope. Um, you get a bit of a sense for when you can stop or when it's good enough. Um, if you've kept your questions quite specific that you're asking of each little prototype part, that can help. Uh, I've put up a term YAGNI, which is from software development. You ain't going to need it which means don't prematurely optimize uh, and try to make something too fancy. If it's just a focused prototype, keep it focused. After a while, you get a kind of feel for good enough, and you can always iterate and refine it later. Jumping back to Super Air. So um, the first thing I did, so I've described how all that worked, or the invoicing, uh, sorry, cost estimations. But yeah, breaking it into smaller parts. The first thing I wanted to do was um, research and investigation. Has anyone kind of done a thing where they're looking at flight lines before that we could use to start getting this cost estimates? And unfortunately, there wasn't. You know, there's 3D flight modeling, 2D flight modeling, which was kind of the simpler thing we actually needed for this, didn't really exist. So what's the next easiest bit? Well, looking at the flight lines up close, I started to notice there was a bit of a theme where between, so the plane's cruising along, the orange lines there are what are called spread lines, that's where it's spreading fertilizer, and the white bits around the end is where it's flying between spread lines. So I noticed when those spread lines are far enough apart, it kind of just looks like a semicircle, and maybe a little straight bit of line if the fence lines didn't line up between the two spread lines. So that's not too tricky, right? So I picked up some tools I already used. I didn't bother about GIS at this stage. You know, with maths, you can draw lines and circles and stuff like that. It's all pretty easy. Just forget about the overhead of real maps and start with just maths with tools I knew. And yeah, didn't take too long. Um, can kind of connect those two things up and good to go. So the next thing I noticed was when the flight lines are closer together, the spread lines are closer together and you kind of end up with this teardrop shaped thing, which is pretty much a semicircle, a bit of a triangle, maybe a bit of a straight line. Once again, if the fence lines don't line up that nicely. And, you know, once you've broken it down into a simple enough dimensions, it's not actually that tricky. A um, bit of smoothing there to make it look nicer. So, I did this work a few years ago and made this presentation this year, and when I actually went back and looked at my notebooks, they, I had literally done what I'm telling you guys to do, <laughs> breaking it down into smaller parts. These are the names of my notebooks that I used. Um, so I've already shown you that interspread lines between the flight paths. Next thing is working out simply for a given paddock, where are you going to split it up and spread, and what order are you going to fly those in? Simple rules, but you know that was another notebook just adding in that layer of complexity. The next thing is actually connecting those two things up. I've just animated that into a GIF there, which is quite hypnotic to watch. <laughs> um, and then the plane obviously has to go back to the airfield every now and then to refuel, to get more fertilizer. Um, so integrating that in. Now those flight lines in between there are a little bit more complicated, but once again, kind of had taken it a step at a time, so it wasn't too bad. Then finally, once I had the whole kind of theory and maths and everything worked out in Jupyter Notebooks, it was actually really quick to move it fully into GIS. So instead of just math polygons that I'd written by hand, actually taking in shape files for a farm, well, you know, sorry, shapes for a farm, and doing the whole calculation was pretty simple. And because I'd kind of worked through the entirety of the logic beforehand, um, not only was it quick, I was able to use type annotations, and I could write tests across the whole thing, unit tests. So you know, you've got a lot of confidence that it's kind of doing the right thing, um, and it all flows pretty nicely. The next example I'm going to talk about is we were asked by a client to develop kind of a science engine with a user interface. Um, the science was kind of mostly known as uh, some agricultural scientists had written research papers, but the UI specification was kind of one of those ones where they give you a 100 page document. It's really complex, but light on sort of specifics or things that make sense. And uh, we suspected it was quite likely to change, but it had a fixed budget and a fixed time frame. 
and the client just kind of came with all kinds of preconceived notions. So the overall approach we took was to break that down into a prototype, get kind of the science engine bit done by itself with a very simple UI in front. And that will allow us to do, to validate the science engine and test kind of the UI that the client thought that they wanted. Is that actually true? And this is where the spreadsheet comes in. So I took the research papers and actually implemented this whole crazy um, nitrogen calculation in spreadsheets. Um, and then I was able to take the spreadsheet tools and implement that in a Python-based API. That was quite, the spreadsheet was awesome. It's quite quick and visual and you can show it to people. Um, and then, because we had the baseline of the spreadsheet, there was a lot of safety in actually writing the code and I could write tests for everything again. Cool, and that prototype actually ended up being extremely valuable. So this was a government department we were doing this work for, and it turned out that we weren't gonna be able to meet their time frame. So it ended up, uh, that was a good thing to learn early because we'd done the prototype. I think we got the best outcome and wasted fewer taxpayer dollars. Um, so that stakeholder testing we did from that allowed us to validate that the science engine was good, but the UI wasn't. And so that was the next iteration we were able to go through. Um, so that's really handy. We solved that, you know, figure that out sooner rather than spending another nine months going down the wrong track. So that's the core of it. So in summary, I mean, you really need to understand the actual problem and break it down into smaller parts. So a few tips for that, always make sure you're focusing on and trying to solve one thing at a time. Reduce that complexity into as fewer dimensions as you possibly can. If you've got the unknown software and the unknown infrastructure, pick one prototype. Um, and if you're trying to implement the solution while you're trying to understand the requirements, you know, once again, break it down, prototype. Always make sure you're just trying to do the next easiest thing. You won't know what that is, but after a while, you kind of get a sense for something that feels like a loose thread that you can start to pull at. And you won't know the whole journey. Um, that's okay. Just take, some, take a step, make some progress. It'll probably work out. Uh, take a break. Um, this picture here is from Milford Sound. So uh, for Super Air, they had this, um, they wanted to introduce waypoints into the flight line. So you could kind of go, oh yeah, the plane's gonna avoid this mountain. And that was pretty complex and I had no idea what to do, but luckily I was on leave and I woke up at 4 a.m. Um, in a tent in Tiana and the idea came to me, so I was scribbling notes on my phone, and then that day I went to go and see Milford Sound. It was pretty cool. But yeah, take a break, and your brain will often just kind of come up with crazy stuff in the background. And this one I really can't reinforce enough. Prototyping and testing is like a golden cycle of awesomeness. You can test your assumptions with simple prototypes, you can learn from the prototypes and test later iterations, and you can build testing into your later iterations, which is just awesome. And, you know, really importantly, you can clarify what the solution isn't and make sure you avoid pitfalls and, you know, going down, spending tons of money doing the wrong thing. And that's the end of the talk. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really proud of my presenter. They all like <laughs> under 17 minutes. It's incredible. So we have a lot of time for questions. Questions. Down there. Hi. Um, do you ever find that your prototypes actually end up becoming the final, the final solution, the final product? Um, I've certainly seen that in the past. Yeah, but I think once you start kind of. I think if you're not really clear on where you're trying, or you know that you're trying to go in a certain direction and you just start developing, then that's a risk that you can run into because your prototype probably just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. If you go in quite consciously going, I, I'm just gonna answer this question with this prototype, you might copy and paste a lot of code or, or use a lot of the bits of the prototype, but hopefully you've kind of kept the initial prototype focused enough that you know, the next iteration can quite clearly be separated. Awesome, thank you. More question here? 
thanks for the talk. It uh, really resonated with me as a consultant. Uh, Can you speak to I, your... Oh, sure. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, uh, my question is around, uh, you mentioned to always focus on the user as opposed to someone like the client. Uh, have you been in situations where the client doesn't necessarily represent the best interests of the user, uh, where they maybe don't understand their user well enough but are very opinionated? Absolutely, yeah. So that science engine one, that was exactly that kind of situation. So the government department that was the client had all these ideas, this is how it should work. Um, and then we got the prototype in the hands of some people who would actually use it. And yeah, that, you know, that was kind of a perfect outcome to discover it as soon as possible, but you know, it's always a, makes friction and stuff like that. So I, I think almost always it's, yeah, the client has their own ideas and they're pretty much always wrong. So one thing we've got at our company is like a UX person who is really great at design thinking. So they can often, like we really push to the client, you've got to get us in front of users, get the design thinking UX person actually in front of users as soon as possible. And you know, just start actually making sure any of these assumptions make sense or what is actually going to be useful, yeah. Okay. We have time for more questions, so if you have more. Sorry, you mentioned UX and that mine immediately sparked. Um, what kind of uh, tools do you use for that? We've got a wireframing stage of planning out actual UX design and workflows. Um, our UX designer uses Figma, but I mean, anything. You can do it in Paint or PowerPoint or you know, just lets you draw boxes and get text on there because UX is kind of more about that flow of of trying to unpick what the business, you know, what the process is actually supposed to be or what the user expects the process to be and just making sure you're laying that out in a kind of clear and logical way, meeting the needs of whatever the thing actually is plus not being too insane for the users. So, yeah, it's, it's not about what it looks like, you know, how pretty it is, but functionally what it is functionally asking at each stage of the process. Um, so yeah, any, there's tons of online tools, I think Miro, Figma, but yeah, you know, if you, if you need to, you can do it in um, draw.io is a pretty cool tool um, that's free. Yeah. Okay, we actually have time for one more question and then we let you go, <laughs> I promise. Anybody else? I do have one more question, more theoretical. So except for dealing with clients, uh, we know it's difficult. What's the other bigger challenge in your step-by-step -step breaking down, in your experience? What's the, so what's the biggest challenge Big there? The challenge in the process, except the user. We know the clients mm. are the challenge. <laughs> Sorry. Love I mean, sometimes there are just gaps, you know, and you have to go away and research and, and you know hunt around online see if someone's done a similar thing before or uh, you know uh, my background's a bit academic so sometimes you have to dive into published journals and things like that well, yeah you know. that's great okay <laughs> thank you so much another round of applause for Stacey thank you Cheers.